everyone. Welcome back to our AOC PMNR podcast. My name is Shahana Momin, and I'm currently a fourth year medical student and one of the co chairs for the AOC PMNR Student Council Public Relations Committee. I will be the host for the podcast today. And with me today, I have Dr. David Sifu, the current Associate Dean for Innovation and System Integration at Virginia Commonwealth University School of Medicine and the Senior Traumatic Brain Injury Specialist for the US Department of Veterans Affairs. Welcome to our podcast, Dr. Sifu. It's my pleasure to host you and thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you very much. It's a privilege to be asked. So uh, I'm all yours. I'm happy to help in any way I can to this important effort of awareness and uh, getting uh, uh, lots and lots of folks engaged in our field. That's cool. Yes, we're really excited to have you and students are going to be thrilled and everybody in PMNR really is going to be thrilled to hear what you have to say, I am sure. I'm uh, before be we... I can't <laughs> wait to hear what I'm going to say. <laughs> a lot of pressure. I'll see if I can live up to it. Go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> It'll, you'll do great. Before um, we go forward with some questions, I just want to give uh, an introduction about your background to the audience. Is that okay? Uh, yeah, don't embarrass me, but yeah, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> I will read what Elise gave me. So I might well, embarrass you a little because you're yeah, a very yeah, accomplished yeah. man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So Dr. David Sifu, MD, is an internationally recognized academic leader and innovator who specializes in initiating, developing, fostering, and leading small and large scale collaborations across the research, clinical, education, and philanthropic area arenas to create knowledge, add value, and build opportunities. He is the Associate Dean for Innovation and System Integration in the Virginia Commonwealth University School of Medicine and the Chairman of the Herman J. Flax MD Endowed Professor of, of the Department of PM&R at VCU School of Medicine in Richmond, Virginia. He is also Chief of PM&R Services for the VCU Health System and Founding Director of the VCU Center for the Rehab Sciences and Engineering, Circe. He is the Senior TBI Specialist for the US Department of Veterans Affairs. He has been funded on 55 research grants for over $258 million, including currently serving as the Principal Investigator of the VA slash Department of Defense $112.2 million long-term impact of military relevant brain injury consortium since 2013. In his more than 30 years as an academic physiatrist, he has delivered more than 600 regional, national, and international lectures, published more than 230 scientific articles, and co-authored or edited 40 books and book chapters. He is the editor-in-chief of the premier line of texts in the field of PM&R, Bradham's Physical PM&R, including the fifth edition textbook, first edition handbook, sixth edition textbook, and second edition textbook. <laughs> Um, yeah, he has been the U.S. DVA champion for the 2009, 2016, and 2021 VA DOD clinical practice guidelines for post-acute TBI management. And in 2021, he was recognized by the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs with the Paul B. Magnuson Award for Outstanding Achievement in Rehabilitation Research and Development. So, right, we're rocking now. <laughs> you might be the most famous person right. that has ever right. come on this podcast, cool. uh, podcast, Dr. Sifu. I, I Googled you and you have your own Wikipedia page. What? Yes, I don't know if you know oh, that. Right. I was like, oh, right. wow, he is famous in the world of PMR. So, thank you so much for being here. It is an honor to host you. Well, thank you, but it's my privilege to be part of this important project you're doing. So, of cool. course. Um, so today we're going to kind of talk about your yeah. journey into the field yeah. and, um, you know, your role as all of the, you know, the different hats that you wear. So as senior TBI specialist, as chairman of the PM&R department at VCU, and kind of just looking at advice that you can provide for students and, you know, delving into your background. So it'll be fun. It'll be, yeah, it'll be a good time. Yeah. Ready? Yeah, sure. Sit back started. and I'll relax. Here we go. Woohoo! Um, so I'm going to throw you a softball. Yeah, you got it. Um, <laughs> how did you first discover the field of PMR? Yeah, it, 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 it's a long story, but I tend to talk a lot, so I'm going to shorten it, um, if that's okay. So uh, I, was, I was a six-year medical student at Boston University, and that's important to the story. I'm not showing off or anything. So I was a six-year med, right? So I was in my, uh, it was, and, and to, to be a six-year med, you go to school in the summers, right? So it was my second summer. It was, it was July Fourth, 1981. It's that specific, um, and um, a bunch of other six-year meds were going uh, to a place called the Esplanade in Boston, where you where you see on July 4th the Boston Pops and John Williams was playing, and they play you know the 
the, the patriotic songs and they do fireworks, right? But in order to get a good seat, you go there early, right? Well, it was, I didn't know this time I was asleep, but it was raining. So uh, uh, yeah, the, the group got there early. I had overslept slash was, had a hangover and was sleeping it off. Um, and was going to join them because they were going to get a good seat. I think about 12 or 15 of them went there. Whatever. And so I'm, you know, laying, lounging in bed. As I'm saying, I get a phone call from one of them from the hospital. I'm like, what? That's not where we're supposed to be, right? And it turns out that one of my co-workers, colleagues, co-students, you know, six year men, um, had been what's called like mudsliding or diving on the esplanade and had injured himself by hitting his chin on a rock, you know, just funds up, but became a C5 quadriplegic as a result of this injury. Um, and, you know, obviously it, it was devastating, yeah. but I hear this, I get on this, I get the phone call. I, you know, I'm like, what? You're kidding. This is, can't be right. Go to the hospital and, and my classmate is there. And over the next three months, I was kind of close to him, but we weren't buds, but, we never, <laughs> but over the next three months, I just became fascinated with the process of recovery um, and of care of people with spinal cord injury because I was, you know, 19 years old. I didn't know <laughs> jack about this. I, didn't, I never even heard of the field of rehab. But the rehab docs, the physiatrists, were the nicest people in the world. The process was cool. I'm like, this is like a movie, right? Um, and they were amazingly supportive. And this was at Boston University. It was some? There was a pretty famous spinal cord injury program back then. Getting um, Murray Freed ran it. But they were just so nice and kind in the therapist, right? Everybody was really cool and nice. And I'm like, this can't be medicine. This is like low stress. It's fun. We're, we're, we're taking care of people with these, you know, devastating injuries, but treating them in a loving, holistic manner. And this was 1981, all right? This isn't like integrative medicine is a big deal. This was back, back in the day. And I just loved it. Uh, and so I, you know, this is before I even got into med school. Uh, and so then, and then when I got into med school, the same group of uh, physiatrists uh, and a lovely woman named Susan Beener Bergman, uh, who was a physiatrist there, just kind of took me under their wing and, you know, and, and kind of dug, you know, that I was into this field. And they're like someone, some medical student or pre-medic, right, likes rehab and wants to do this. And he kind of seems kind of normal and happy. And what is going on, you know? Um, because it was really my first engagement. You know, I'd had, like everybody writes in their write-up, I had some sports injuries in high school and I maybe I went to a therapist, physical therapist once, but I couldn't make believe that I was an athlete, you know? But, but, but I really was able to kind of experience this and just loved it. You know, I just fell in love early on. And, and you know, there was that and the fact that the physicians, as well as the great therapists and nurses and social workers, were just so welcoming and kind and you know to to my colleague that was injured and and to this day he's obviously still paralyzed and in a wheelchair and he's a, a psychiatrist and is, yeah. is practicing he's doing great but i got to see the field and just absolutely loved it and i never looked back so wow so you kind of had like both your pmnr moment and your like tbi moment at the yeah, same, yeah, at the same time yeah 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 i got to see it all wow. yeah, yeah and, and that was and just like this is like, this is like space age stuff. Yeah, you know? yeah, you know, exactly. Stuff. Anyway, so that was my thing. You know, I hope nobody else nice. has to ever experience that because it's not ideal on any level, but, but it was really just a, a welcome call to it. Otherwise, I would have never really heard about it until my third or fourth year. So Yeah, and it's really good to hear that even in the 80s, everybody in rocking. the field, yeah, yeah, everyone was still great and super yeah. nice. And that's never fun. changed. Yeah. I feel like that's universal and that'll be a timeless thing that the field has. Yep. 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 So you have a, such an impressive career. You've accomplished so much from when you were you know, 19 and you had that Eureka moment. Um, can you talk about your path to becoming like associate dean and senior TBI specialist for the U.S. Veterans Affairs? Yeah, I mean, at this point, I should say that you should like read all these these books about, you know, life planning and you should set five year goals and <laughs> you should set, you know, you know, both realistic goals as well as reach goals. And, and it just isn't how I've ever worked. Uh, I was brought up by parents that worked hard and, and encouraged me to work hard and, and you know, uh, rewarded uh, both hard work, but also successes. And so I've always really just been someone who just does a lot of stuff. You know, I probably would have been called ADHD now, but you know, I just <laughs> like to do things. Uh, and so, you know, very early on in my career, I learned a key word 
that really enamored me to people and got a lot of stuff done. And that the word is yes. When someone asks me, Dave, will you help to write this guide? Or Dave, will you see an extra patient in clinic? Or, you know, I, nobody really wants to do this job, but will you do this job? I'm like, yeah, sure. I'm a resident or I'm a medical student or I'm a faculty member. I want to do stuff, right? I've never met someone I haven't wanted to collaborate with, write a grant with, see a patient with. And so, so saying yes is really important. Uh, and, and seeing the joy in everything you do. I, I have run every kind of clinic. You can imagine the good and the bad ones. I've injected every body part. Most of it didn't work. I've done all, the, I've done, you know, there's nothing I haven't done in our field. And each time I've learned something new and loved it. And, you know, over time that shapes me, I guess. But really, I, I've just learned so many things from just saying yes and doing them and failing. I've, you know, a, only a third of my grants ever got funded. I just wrote a lot of grants. You know, many of my articles have been rejected and then revised. And, you know, fortunately, most of my patients did well, but, yeah. you know, some didn't do well the first couple of times. So, you know, say yes, uh, work hard, be nice, smile. I love to smile. I love to laugh. I like to sing. Am I good? I like to just have fun people. And I've got, you know, energy, enthusiasm, like, you know, I don't sleep much, but, but, you know, I think it's really important. People, people want to be around someone that wants to kind of move the rock and do things. And I'm happy to be a team member and a supporter or a leader. You know, that's what our field teaches you early on. Like be part of a team, like lead when it's appropriate, facilitate, you know, be part of it, contribute, you know, be quiet sometimes, just listen. Um, uh, and then probably the last thing is I've been at my university for 31 years and I've started, trust me, I didn't start as an associate dean. I didn't start as a big time researcher. I was the lowest person on the totem pole. You know, I, I, I practiced in a year in Houston after my residency, where it's where I did it. And then I came to Richmond. I've been in Richmond ever since. And I just know everybody in my institution. And, you know, I've done favors for them. I've worked with them. I've helped them. And and I've just learned the system. So I know a lot of people like to jump around, but I, I don't advise that. Just kind of, I mean, find, I mean, where I live is an amazing place. So that's one of the reasons. But find a niche that's yours and, and create it and carve it and be willing to move around within that, you know, within that space. And so I haven't always been what I do now. I started off as a geriatric person, did lots of uh, um, uh, uh, inpatient work. And then I did a lot of interventional work and pain work and I've evolved to, and the last, last thing I promise is um, have good outcomes. Like, 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 so work hard so that you get things published and you get grants funded and, and you know, so, so really, and, and you take good care of your patients. When you do that, when you produce, it doesn't have to be an A plus every time, but you know, you're gonna finish stuff. You know, people really look to you to do, to, to, for that. I mean, that's, I think that's one of the things people say, if you want something done, give it to Dave. Uh, I'm gonna finish it. And I'm gonna, and you know, I'm not gonna always do it all. I have partners, I have collaborators, so, but, but, but don't just like kind of, go along for the right finish stuff, you know, and, and, and own it and take pride in it. You know, whether you're building a brick wall or writing a book, do it, you know, put, work at it, put your back into it, put your mind to it. Um, and, you know, and, you know, work-life balance, I don't actually know what those words mean. I guess they, mean <laughs> they must mean something to somebody, but to me, it's all, I love my work. So I don't know, I'm, you know, I have plenty of free time as well. I'm a rehab doc, like, what am I doing? You know, you know I'm, not, I'm, not, like, I'm not working a hundred hours a week. So when I'm working, I'm work, you know, like this, I'm writing a grant this whole weekend. I'm excited as heck about it. I am, you know, and that's going to be fun for me. So, you know, th those things together, you know, mm -hmm. but I think the saying yes and yeah. doing it with enthusiasm. Yeah. People like that. You know, I want that's people a, to say yes. And yeah. Thing, you know, you know? Yeah. Like say yes, see it through and be yeah, yeah. kind of have that infectious and, joy. Yeah. And if it isn't perfect, it's okay. Life continues. Yeah. I like, smile and move on, take a walk, yeah. you know, and do some exercise, meditate, and then get do the next thing. Like, like don't be the Grinch or the, yeah. you know, don't be a curmudgeon. If you know, yeah. You know, and don't be arrogant either. I, I you know, like, like, like you're not that good. Like no matter how good you think you're, you're not Stay that humble. good. Stay humble. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's such a great philosophy. I love that. That's yeah, well, with all it, of everything that you accomplished. It'll yeah, pay. I was like, yeah. I think it's the small moments too that give you that unexpected like opportunity that you don't always see. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I have no say. idea my direction. It happens. Like I kind of know what I want to do, but 
just do yeah. stuff. Man. I mean, from waking up late that one day to I know, where right? you are I, now. <laughs> but, but for the grace of God, could have been me. You know, I was a mud diver. You know, don't ever do that, by the way. But yeah, I was like, nope. Well, yep. thank you for sharing that. That was yeah, that yeah. was really great. And I think very heartwarming, I'm sure, for our audience members. Um, so can you talk about a little bit, like that was amazing advice, but can you talk a little bit about your role as senior TBI specialist for the US Department of Veterans yeah, Affairs? That's yeah, such yeah, a unique yeah. position. I just wanted yeah, to kind of hear more about yeah, that. Yeah, it's something I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm proud of the work I've done with veterans. So again, as brief as I can, um, I, I, you know, was, uh, established a reputation as someone who knew something about rehab and brain injury. And so, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the local VA where, where I was at um, kind of said, you know, there's a war on, it was like 2004-ish and stuff, and you work in the VA some, but, you know, we really could use a lot of help and someone like you, because I was a chair at that time, and I'd been the president of the Academy of PM&R. So I, I was kind of somebody, you know, whatever is. Um, and, and they said, you know, we would really love for you to take a more active role in our Richmond VA. And, and then, so in 2000, end of 2005, I said, sure, I'll, I got nothing else to do. I got, I'm, I'm not that busy. I'll become, I'll run the brain injury unit during the war, right? And, you know, and so this was 2006, I started. And then by 2007, I'm the chief of the rehab service of that VA because they're like, well, you know, you're doing such a good job running this, can you also do that? I'm like, absolutely, sure. I always say yes, right? And then I'm like doing that. And then, you know, uh, 2009, the national leader of the VA says, you're not, you're really doing a great job in Richmond and we love you on the phone calls and the meetings, you've got a lot of energy. You say yes, would you be the number two person in the entire VA in rehab? I'm like, yeah, sure, why not? I got free time, let's do that, right? And then in like 2010, I became the national director. So I became the number one person because the person retired. I'm like. Sure, I got nothing else to do, right, right. And so I, during the war, I'm very proud I helped to set up and support. I didn't do all of it, of course, but with a great team across the country of rehab services. There were 550 physicians, 3,900 different therapists, and we helped to kind of do administrative things, coordinate, create a, a unified system. I mean, I'm, I love the VA system, love our, our, our troops, all those kind of things. And it's also fascinating. You know, our, our field is, was built on the shoulders of people with disabilities and the military. So I'm able to be a national leader of all rehab in the VA system during a war. Are you kidding me? Loving this, right? You know, yeah. while I'm juggling 16 other things, you know. Um, but I said, this is great, right? So then as the war started to wind down around 2014, 15, or started to get slower, they said, Dave, what we really need you to do is not just do the PMR thing, but why don't you just really focus on brain injury things? Because that's the signature injury. And I'm like, absolutely, that sounds awesome, right? And so I kind of 2014-ish kind of shifted to that role. And that's the role I still have where I help to provide leadership across the nation for all things brain injury in the VA system, provide consultative support to the military. Um, and, you know, it's obviously, it's an area of interest of mine now and it's my research, but it was, again, I knew what I was doing because I worked hard. You know, I'm not that brilliant. I'm not that magical. There's nothing good. I just work, read a lot, you know, uh, and, you know, like to travel around kind of talking to people, not always lecturing, but listening as well. And again, I'm in the right spot. And, uh, and I'm like, and people said, you know, people kind of dig you. You seem to be a good leader. You know what you're talking about? Would you help to run this? And, uh, and I'm like, sure. And I learned how to run things and be a leader by doing it. Yeah, I took courses. I was in some VA leadership training. I read the shark book and the cheese book and, and I've read all those things, but, and that's cute. It's nice, you know, that they're important. Uh, you know, I don't ignore them, uh, but you gotta do things, you know? And so, you know, I was not the best leader when I started. I'm not the best leader now, but I'm getting better every job I take. You know, and so I, you know, I took a dean job so I could kind of learn about administration in the medical school. I did that, you know. So, so again, the, the VA thing, I'm very, very proud of. I've helped to, you know, uh, support the great work that they did during the war and continue to do. And my successor in the PM&R leadership role, Joel Skelton, who was someone that I helped to mentor, is just phenomenal. You should interview Joel. He is beyond awesome. He's also the oh. tallest physiatrist that I know. He's like six seven, six eight, but he's just oh, wow. nice. nicest guy. I love <laughs> Joel. So he grew up in the uh, in the Tampa VA uh, program. Now he's in Washington. He's just 
but there's just so many great people in our VA system and in, in the rehab world as well as just in FEMA and general. But anyway, so that was that role. I kind of, you know, the VA and the military asked me to support something. And I got to do a, a lot of amazing things during the war. I spent time with the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the Pentagon. I met with the president a couple of times. It's kind of cool. Yeah. You know, I, you know, I did a lot of, you know, I did a lot of like consulting work and talking to people and they have no, they still have no idea what rehab is, but they're like, whatever you're doing, Dr. C, if you keep doing that, you know, we don't know what you're talking about exactly, but, you know, it, it seems to be working for the troops and the service members and the veterans, excuse me. Uh, so please keep doing it. So, you know, our, just like other great people in our field, you just got to get involved and do it. You know, you got to shape some of it. Nobody knows what rehab is. My parents, God bless them, never knew what rehab <laughs> is, you know, it's just a thing. You do it. And, you know, you know that it's working because people with significant difficulties are getting well and living great lives. Yeah, that's so true. And I mean, there's so many things that you're even doing now. What's like, what's the project that you're most excited about right now that you're working on? Yeah, I like all my projects. Um, um, <laughs> well, I'm doing um, a lot of consulting work with other countries uh, to kind of help them to set up rehab systems, working with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I'm working with Poland. I'm doing a little bit of work in China. Um, which I really like to do. And uh, I think this is, I don't know if people will believe this, but, but there's nothing magical or even great about the American PM&R system. I don't mean the physicians, I mean the way rehab is set up. And so I don't actually typically recommend to these countries that they follow what we do because we're way overpriced and overbuilt and we're way too focused on super specialization. Like you don't need a PhD or a DPT to deliver a therapy or you don't need an MD to do most of the things that I'm doing. So what are the things that you can do with the boots on the ground personnel you have in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia? They have a certain group of folks to take care of people in China, same thing, you know, in Poland, you know, what do you need? Let's figure out how to be culturally sensitive to what is appropriate for this setting and stop believing that what we do in American rehab is somehow better. I, I, I haven't seen that research. Maybe I missed that. But I haven't seen that. So that's that's an area that I really am excited about is taking the fundamentals of our field, interdisciplinary care, you know, patient centric, you know, integrating holistic, you know, work, you know, understanding who the person is, appreciating, you know, that people with health disparities have a higher incidence and problem with with disability. And how do we meet all those things together? Loving that, you know, and so how do we bring that in a non you know, Anglo or non-American way. Yeah. That's awesome. I love it. The only other thing I'm doing is I'm working with a, a, co a corporation that's building um, uh, affordable housing for, for, for the most part for frontline, uh, first line uh, responders uh, that is holistic and is healing. Uh, so it's offering a wellness type of community uh, um, to individuals that, you know, are in the, are, are, are making a, middle income kind of uh, um, uh, dollars, but really aren't, don't have um, uh, a full grasp on how to incorporate wellness into where they live. So the places that these communities they're building are wellness driven. They're not, they don't just have health clubs, but they, they, you know, they're built with, it's renewable products and it's, it generates its own energy and you get dollars off your rent if you do things, if you eat healthy, if you eat vegan, and I'm a vegan, one should always eat vegan. Um, or if you exercise, or if you're if you're on a sleep wakes uh, program, so it's really a cool thing, um, and you know importantly, it's got corporate dollars behind it. So like Apple likes it, and and some of the other corporations are like, yeah, we'd like to have you know that in our neighborhood. You know, our workers probably make too much to qualify to live there, but we want those kind of healthy environments in you know where our workers are. So I'm jazzed about it. It's it's using. Yeah everything that we do in our field to, in, to enhance wellness and well-being um, uh, in a you know, real world kind of way. I like doing my research too, but I want to apply it. So. Like translational and yeah, yeah, yeah. to impact totally. quality of life. Yeah, on a big yeah. scale. I really like that you're so invested in the global physiatry because that's an interest of yeah, mine. And I, every, every, I feel like everyone that I've talked about is like, oh yeah, well, you know, a lot of places don't have a, you know, as established system as we do because you know, they tell, you know, they say Americans value independence. And that's something where, you know, I think there's such an opportunity to do so much intercultural global work. And we need to leave, we need to leave some of our 
yeah classisms off to the side you know yeah. and, and, and also you know i, I a lot of people uh, in, in healthcare and rehab folks and, and trainees are like, well, when there's a big crisis, uh, a tsunami, I want to go help. I'm like, those people don't need rehab. Those people need food yeah. and water and, and housing. What you might be able to do is help those settings to set up wellness and preventative strategies so that as those people are getting their lives back, they're doing it in a way that is sustainable and that you can be helping. And yes, you can teach people about amputee care and brain injuries. I get that. But but you know, I, I you know, I think like like it's so ego said, like, do you think they need a rehab unit in a tsunami feel? Are you kidding me? <laughs> they, need, <laughs> yeah. they need fresh water and they need food and they need a place to live. All right. Yeah. That's not what my training is in. I don't know how to purify water or even put up a tent. Okay. Can we please let's figure out what we could be doing, you know? Yeah. And so I think we have to, you know. It's not about what I, as a privileged person in the American healthcare system, can bring you. That's really not, you know, it, it's how can we partner on this? Let me listen to you. And it's a hard thing to do, but, you know, we do need to help others and help each other, you know, do better, but we need to do it from their frame of reference, you know, exactly. or just write a check. I mean, if you can't do that, just write a check, which I like, to, do. Yeah. I like to support causes, but, you know, it's like, 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 like don't bring your baggage in. Yeah. Don't try to, you know, put all of your like ethics and value systems on a whole other yes, cultural society. Yeah, we are. We are. So that's, I like that. That's your philosophy. I feel like more of us should adopt that and kind of less missionary. Approach yes. Those yes. Those haven't oh. exactly panned out well for the people involved. I hundred percent agree with that. No. Uh, are there any new initiatives that you've implemented as chairman of the PMNR department at Virginia Commonwealth specifically? Yeah, I mean, it's my 24th or fifth year, so it's been a lot of stuff. Yeah. You know, I, I think that the biggest thing that 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 we're we're making a big, I mean, we're doing a lot of cool things. I could literally go on forever, but but one thing is that we uh, uh, established a a committee of, a little over two years ago, which is focused on 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 uh, DEI, um, uh, you know, diversity and and, and excellence and inc inclusivity, um, and we did it before it was cool. Before there was COVID, before it was Black, Black Lives Matter, all that stuff, you know, because there were and wasn't wasn't Dave's initiative, but several of my faculty came to me and said, you know what, we have the opportunities. We're a high performing department. We have resources. We've got, you know, great people. But we really want to make a bigger difference across this university and across our disability system. And I'm like, let's do this. Yes, I said, Dave probably isn't the right person because I can talk it, but I don't know if I always walk it. You know, I got to be fair. I, I was very fair. I said, but you know what? You people that have come to me, I am officially empowering you. You are the head of this group, this work group. That's now got about 10 folks, very diverse group and stuff, whatever it is, who are just awesome. And, you know, I, I, we help to resource them, but, but, you know, we've trained all our residents. We've trained our faculty. We partnered with other departments that needed training in the space. We opened a new IRF about a year, a little over a year ago, and we, we're, we're, we're training all of the staff in this large IRF to be not just more inclusive, but, but we're trying to actually get rid of the whole racism thing because it's nice to add inclusivity, but if people still have hate and, and racism in their space, that's, you can't pack more into it. So we're trying to let some of that air out and people are raving about it, loving it. Uh, you know, in 10 years, we'll, t we'll, we'll let you know if it actually works. But, you know, we've been doing this and just because it was the right thing to do. Now it's kind of hip and cool. I feel kind of like, well, you know. Like I started you know, that. <laughs> I didn't do it for that reason at all. I and mean, it's the right thing to do. Our, it is. Our department is so diverse and so cool. And it's just great to be there. And we're high, high producing. We have awesome work-life balance, I guess. I mean, I like my life and work, so I don't know. But if people you know, have commented on that. But, but I think it's in part because we are very open to realizing that we don't have the answer. And, and we really want to make sure we're open to that. And, we are, and we're being very, um, a very uh, uh, um, proactive and very mindful that we want to do, we need to drive this. All right, and, and, and we're doing it because it's gonna make everything better, not just our department. It's not gonna help one person that we happen to know. It's gonna really be, we wanna open opportunities. So that's the, I, I'm very 
proud of the, my group that has done that. I will not take credit for it, but I'm happy to be supporting it. Um, we have a lot of cool initiatives, but I think that's one that I think every department shouldn't just give lip service to and, you know, and, and bring in a consultant. Yeah, I bring in a consultant. Okay. You know, I, we did that. We've had these people talk and like, yeah, they're good. I love this person. Can I, will that person work? You know, you know, you meet these DEI consultants. I'm like, how are you the same species as me? You are so in touch with this. I didn't even know what the problem was. It's cool. So you got to do that. <laughs> but then how do you actually embody it day to day? And it's hard. It's work. You know, yeah. it's like, I, you know, it's like anything else I'm talking about. You put, put your, put your mind to it and work it and do it and say yes to it positive things I'm, I'm so pleased with that yeah and try you know, kind of try new things and see yeah. if that will actually stick because this is something that should be a sustainable change yep. that's it, awesome gotta be, and keep it real it's gotta be you're doing it for the right I, it makes it us right all reason. better yeah i mean it's what america was supposedly founded on this whole melting pot thing and now yes. all of a sudden we're like it's a disaster so you know we need to kind of be doing our part in health care Dr. Sikri, you remind me of, I don't know if you've seen Ted Lasso, but you remind me of the Ted Lasso I seminar. Ted Lasso. I love Ted Lasso. Although so much. I like I like the other guy. I like Roy better. Oh yeah. <laughs> of Roy course. keeps it real. He keeps yeah, it real. Yeah. yeah. Yes. No, but, but you know what? Like I have had a blessed life. I, I you know, I'm just fortunate in so many ways. And you know, I try to continue to grow that among everybody that I'm with and stuff. And like, why wouldn't you be positive if you're a rehab doc? Like this is awesome. Like you're helping all these people. And, you know, and, and, and it, one of the reasons I love rehab is that people actually thank you for what you do. Like I, I, to me, you don't have to thank me. A, it's my job. I'm getting paid. You know, it, it makes me feel good inside. You know, maybe I won't go to hell, that kind of stuff because I'm doing nice things. But they actually thank you too, you know? And like my, the, the, the most rewarding time I have when I, when I do inpatient rounds is bringing people a glass of ice water. All right, or opening their carton. I like that so much more than listening to their lungs or diagnosing their intracranial hemorrhage. <laughs> Those are interesting. But I'm like, like you know, people, uh, they're like, oh, okay. you're, you're a doctor. You don't have to do that. I'm like, no, no, no. I have to get you a glass of ice water. Trust me. <laughs> like I, wanna, I need to do this. Yeah. I want to play with your grandchild and talk to her and listen. I love that. Yeah. That getting to know and helping, really helping. I love that part of it. So our field yeah. is just, you know, we're so privileged to be able to help people. Um, so, you know, you need to be positive. If you're not positive, go into something else, yeah. like go into business, be a business person. <laughs> yeah. Don't be a physician or in healthcare. Yeah. yeah you got to love that simple human connection that has oh. absolutely nothing to do with medicine. You no. have to love that. I, love I live for that. Yes. Yeah. I totally feel you. Well, thank you so much for chatting with us today. Is there any, you've given us so many, you know, nuggets of wisdom and so much advice today that, that our members and that our listeners yeah. can use, but is there any last minute advice that you want to leave our listeners with today? Um, maybe there's two little things. Number one okay. is like, if you're considering going into this amazing field that I've been sort of describing and stuff like that, and you know, there are so many amazing reasons to go into it. There's, there's limitless jobs, limitless diversity in the jobs and you can balance your hours, if, you know, in any way you like. There's probably you can make as much money as you actually want to in it. It's cool that way too, I guess. You know, money's way overrated. You'll learn as you get as you begin to make it. I'm like, yeah, it's nice, but you know, you know, what 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 what's the point of it all? But I, I think the big thing to recognize is like this field just keeps giving back to you. And if you don't feel that way and you're in the field, get to it, pivot and do a different part of it. You know, that because there's so many amazing things in what we do. You know, I love doing like nursing homework. It's so cool and so needed, you know, but, but if you're not digging it, if you feel like it's a grind or you're like, well, I don't want to be stuck in something, you're in rehab. You ain't never stuck in something. You can always do something different. All right. So, so that's number one. If you're thinking about doing this, you can change what you do and what hats you wear, et cetera every couple of years, if you wish, or add it to your bag, you know, those kind of things. That's, that's important. And the, and the other, other thing is like, like be nice to people, like to students like you, you know, and to, and to administrators, and even people that are being schmucks, like be nice to them, like show them love and kindness and those kind of things. And they don't come around, you know, that, I, that's unfortunate, but I have typically found people over time 
get worn away by niceness and smiling and laughter and you know and and, and appreciation you know and and love kind of stuff so so i would absolutely don't lose that. I see so many people that become interns, like, oh, my internship here was so bad and I worked so hard. Did, and, you know, yeah. It's terrible. I'm like, yeah, it does suck. I was one, I was there, you know, I hated it. But I'm like, it's the steps, you know, being a fourth year medical student, it's a step, you know, and, but, you know, embrace it and, and realize that you can, you can pivot after a year of internship and be a resident. And if you don't like PM and our residency, you're not in a good program because the residencies are awesome. I, I mean, I love my residency and our, I know our residents love it as well. Not every second of every day and every minute, but overall, what? it's awesome, you know, but, but definitely, uh, but, but try to be kind and nice throughout, not just around Christmas or not just when, you know, there's some tragedy in the world, you light a candle and you sing Kumbaya, that's cool. But like, try to do it every day and be appreciative of, of what we have. So. That's, that's, I know that's a little sappy, but it's true. No, it's and great. Perfect. Embody that like goodness, yeah. basically. Yeah. Put it, yeah. put it back in the world. Yep. If you can. Yep. Is there a place? Forward or backwards. Yeah, what? Yes. Oh, sorry. Is there a place that our um, listeners can connect with you, stay updated on what's kind of going on? Heck yeah. Uh, probably there is. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I, mean, I, I would, I, you can Google my, my email address. You're welcome to email me directly and say hi to me if you wish. I'll, I will respond. I'm very good about doing that. Um, it's dcifu at vcu.edu. It's been the same one for 31 years. Hasn't changed. Uh, you can send me that. Uh, in addition, I do some podcasts through through the Abstract Athlete. If you Google the Abstract Athlete, uh, it's uh, Abstract Athlete is a uh, a collaboration between this the, this, the uh, Department of Arts, Athletics, and Rehabilitation at VCU, and and it's a nationwide thing. We have professional athletes who are artists and are healing from brain injuries, PTSD, pain injuries, and they use art and creativity to heal themselves and to enhance who they are. It's called The Abstract Athlete. Uh, it's kind of cool. Uh, I love yeah. doing it. Um, and, and, you know, so, and I do podcasts on that as well. The whole bunch of podcasts. I've, I've met some really cool professional athletes as well as service members who were amazing and healers and lots of cool artists. It's neat. You know, so you can, you can kind of hear me doing that stuff. Uh, or if you're in Richmond, you're going to be in Richmond. Give me a, send me a message. We can get together, have a beer or uh, have a glass of water, whatever you like. You can hang. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I had so yeah. much fun. I hope yeah. that you did too, Dr. Sifu. Yeah, so fun. yeah, I really appreciate having the opportunity to chat. And I'm sure that everyone else is going to enjoy this as much as I did. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words. Thanks for thank what you're doing. And, uh, all the best uh, in your career as well as other folks watching it. Stay in touch too, okay? Yes, of course. Have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.